So in previous lecture, we have uh, studied how we measure GDP, how we measure price, and how we measure labor market. And then in this lecture, we are going to study the behavior of a representative consumer and the, rep and the behavior of a representative firm. So the reason why we look at consumer and the firm's behavior is because macroeconomics, in this modern macroeconomics, we have what we call the micro foundation. Micro foundation. Meaning this is a this is a bottom-up approach, meaning so we just start with each individuals. This is including the consumer, and then later we talk about the firm's behavior. And then so we look at how they are into how they are going to interact, how they are going to aggregate in macroeconomic phenomena. So actually, this chapter is called consumer and firm behavior. Right. So then we are going to talk about work leisure decision that's from the consumer side, and profit maximization that's from the firm side. So this, this slide is going to serve as a motivation. John Keynes, he was considered the founding father of modern macroeconomics. Back in 1930, John Keynes wrote in the essay, it's called Economic Possibility for Our Grandchildren, or in other words, he's trying to make some predictions regarding to how the economy is going to look at in the future. And he believed that his grandchildren, so that's roughly like people who was living around like 2000, they would work only 15 hours a week. But now let's look at reality. So Gallup is a report. So that what they found is in 2014, the average full-time American put in nearly 47 hours a week. But certainly if you look at some European country, so this number is slightly lower, but still, so it's far different from four, uh, 15 hours has been predicted by John Maynard Keynes. But then so why Keynes was so far off base or what was his thinking or what was his thinking was missing. So that's the main thing that we are going to discuss. Okay. So in this chapter, in this uh, part of this chapter, we are going to start looking at representative consumer. So what does representative means? That just means here we just look at a economy. So all individuals, they are the same. They endow with the same things. They have the same preference. They have the same budget. So eventually they're going to make the same decision. You may wondering, is this a reasonable assumption? Certainly not. But then what's a better alternative? A better alternative is going to be, say, individual different. But then certainly you are going to need more complex an analysis or more complex tools to analyze, right? But nevertheless, to start with a representative consumer, it turns out a very good starting point, right? So that's why we start with this framework. So in terms of consumer, so how we are going to describe their behavior or what's going to characterize what are important to understand their behavior. We are going to start with their preference. What is preference? And what they like, right? So this this person we're going to look at. Next, we're going to look at what are the constraints they are going to have, right? Typically, so here says so there's a budget constraint, okay? And then finally, so we're going to look at consumers' objective or what they're trying to achieve. So this is what we call optimization problem. Okay? So based on this description, we are going to write a simple model, and then this model is going to use to understand the following question. How does the consumer respond to, say, for example, increase in non-wage income, an increase in the market real wage? Okay, as we can see later, so this is going to have different implications. Why? Usually we call income effect. Let's go write out income effect. The other is going to be a substitution effect substitution okay. but then so in most real economy case usually you can observe it too right so this is where we start now let's use the example to understand how the consumer make decision and what matters for consumers make decision let's start with preference or in other words i'm going to use the example to explain to you what does preference means 
just imagine there's a gentleman, his name is Ben. His job is a tennis coach. He works as a tennis coach. So he is going to earn or on average earn $30 per hour by giving lessons. But you can imagine his real passion may be different from what his job or what he's doing. His real passion may be skydiving. He likes skydiving. Now, he is going to make a tough decision. This is going to be how many hours to work each year and how much how much leisure is going to take. Okay. Then, so when he makes such a decision, right, and then so he's facing the trade-off. If he decided not to, not to work, right, and then so he's going to sorry. If he decides to work, right, and then what's the cost? The cost of work another extra, uh, uh, sorry, the cost of working an extra hour leads to a loss of an hour of skydiving. This is something he really enjoyed. Or in other words, he's losing one hour of happiness. But what's the benefit? Working one hour, he's going to benefit from $35 income. So now you can see there's a trade-off. Okay, so the trade-off. The trade-off is between cost and the benefit. And then so how it's going to make a decision. And certainty is going to see which one dominates what. Now we can write this in a very abstract way, or we are going to put in a model. Right? So we can we can say an individual, so like say, you know, in this case a band or in general, the representative households. So usually they care about two goods. One is consumption goods. But remember this consumption goods, usually this is a bundle. Or this includes pretty much everything we consume or we can derive utility or derive happiness. Right? So this includes food, okay? Closing, those are basic necessity. Maybe travel, okay? Maybe entertainment, other entertainment. Okay. You, can, you can also think about maybe education, right? So on and so forth, or, or healthcare. And then we use this CT denote, but clearly, so we are this is going to measure in terms of money. I mean, or there's like a monitor value, or the, or there's like a market value for these C, we just add them together. Right? It's first is consumer cares. The other thing is consumer cares is leisure. And the economy usually use this term L, leisure, to denote or of the job activity. Okay? This includes, this includes, say for example, sleep. Right? Social. Okay? Or just play. But again, play with your with your friends, so on and so forth. Okay, etc. But clearly so we are subject to a constraint, right? But first let's just let's see what's the constraint we're gonna face in terms of leisure. So everyone we have 24 hours per day, right? So this is this is the maximum hour. But usually we don't we don't use this as the uh, as the maximum hour. Usually we subtract eight hours because usually on average an individual needs eight hours sleep. So hence, so this is like sixteen hours. Sixteen hour, that's the hard constraint. Every individual must face. Now, given these two goods, and then the consumer is going to derive utility from these two goods. And U refers to utility. So essentially, this is a function, mathematical function that map C and L, the combination of C and L. For any combination of C and L, it's going to give you a number. Okay, this is like a rational number. And usually, it's higher the number, meaning so you're going to have here. So that's how we understand this. Right. So now, 
we have some property or we are going to characterize or specify this purpose a little bit. Right? We can say C1 and C2, these two, these are bundle. Right? So this is strictly preferred by consumer to the other bundle. If this first bundle generates a large number compared to the second bundle, as I say, so this U is just a mapping, it's mapping a combination of C and L to a number, right? So if you prefer this bundle, that means this two is gonna de deliver a higher number compared to this two. And furthermore, we say the consumer is indifferent between the two consumption bundles. If these two bundles give you the same level of enjoyment or happiness, Right, so there are more to come. Right, so to understand what this two, what this two means. Right? Okay. So now, for all those bundles, let's go back. Right, so I mean, I'm just saying. So there, there are more than two bundles going to give you the same level, but there could be there are many, many of them. Now we are going to, we are going to connect all those dots or those points. That represent the consumption bundles among which consumers indifferent. We connect them all together. And there's we are going to have an indifferent curve. And this again, so this indifferent curve is just a curve. Along this curve, you have you're going to see the consumer is going to consume a different bundle of goods between C and L. But each of those bundles is going to derive the same level same level of utility. Okay, so we can understand the utility as, as a measure of happiness, right? But regarding to this indifferent curve, there are certain things we are new, and those are very intuitive. More is always preferred to less. Second, the consumer like diversity. And the third, Consumption and leisure are normal goods. So let's let's go a little bit in detail what this means. More is always preferred to less. That just means so if you you always prefer a bigger house, you prefer to eat better or more food, okay? you prefer to have a nicer phone. Okay? This is more always preferred to less. The second thing is a consumer like diversity. Meaning, so you don't want to repeatedly do the same things, consume the same food every day. Okay, so you want you want different variety. Okay, and the third, so consumption, these are normal goods. That just means when income increase, when your income increase, when income increase, and then your consumption will increase, your leisure is going to increase. By the way, so with the leisure in increase. Usually that immediately means your labor supply or how many hours you're going to work is going to decrease. Okay. So now we are going to have a graph to explain to you what is the interference curve. And from this graph, we are going to understand those three things we just discussed. Okay. So let's start with this one. I usually is represent indifferent curve. Right. And so this is a curve, and this curve is on this leisure versus consumption diagram. Right. And there's along this indifferent curve, you can see you have different bundles, so it's a B and a D, so they are different. They are different in terms of, in the sense, B in B, so you have more consumption, but then so you have less leisure. And then they think about the case of Ben. The example we have, that just means that work a lot, work a lot. But then, so he, because like in that example, so here he cares about skydiving, right? And for that example, that just means he skydive less. But then, so he may can consume more other stuff right so you're going to need to drive a better car 
you have a nice house, right? Now, in terms of D, what happens is he work a little, okay? And then, so he don't have much money and then he consume less. He consume less other stuff. So this is the difference between B and D, but certainly, so he consume less, but he take more leisure, right? So you can see there's a trade-off. Okay, so B and D, so I just give you the same level of happiness, right? But clearly there are many of them. So now what's I2? I2 is an indifferent curve. That's going to give you a higher level, higher level of utility. If you can imagine there's a 3D and then there's another dimension. And then, so essentially, so this I, I2, it is going to refer to a higher level in this third dimension. But here we just project this into this two dimensional world. Right. So this is indifferent curve. Now, let's look some, let's take a closer look of the indifferent curve. We find out first, indifferent curve slows downward. Okay. And then why does downward? It means it's more, it's always, pre, it's always preferred to less. Okay. And the second, the indifferent curve is convex. Okay. And this means the households prefers diversity. Now let's use this diagram to understand this a little bit further. It's downward, right? So this downward, right? So you always prefer, prefer, you always prefer more than less. Okay. So what this means, this downward, it just imagine if it is upward, okay? If it is upward. So that's gonna differ. That just means, okay, so I prefer less, not more. Okay. So it's downward just means, okay, so I prefer more, right? Specific example, so if I just go to this direction, meaning, so I'm going to, you have to give me more L1 as a compensation for less C2. Okay, if it's all work, which means, so I'm going to, you need to, you need to give me both more C1 and, and L1, right? So this is number one. Now, what does convex means? The convex means essentially this curve, this curve, like mathematically, the slope of this curve is de decreasing. The slope, right? The slope. So by the way, what is slope? The slope, the slope, oh, by the way, so here we just talk about absolute value. Absolute value of the slope. So the absolute value of the slope is given by, so if you, if you, if you look at here, okay? so essentially it's given by change in C divided by change in L, okay? But then, so furthermore, what this means, because this just means this is the opportunity cost, opportunity cost, opportunity cost of, of what? the cause of leisure in terms of consumption, right? So now, but certainly, so we have another name for the, for, for this uh, slope. Let's just wait for the next slide. For now, let's use the language opportunity cost. So but what this means, this means, okay, so in order to gain one more unit of leisure, how much consumption I'm willing to give up. So this opportunity cost. Now, if this opportunity cost is decreasing, meaning I'm willing to give up less and less. C to gain L. Right, so my willingness or my opportunity cost of leisure, of leisure is declining. But what this declining actually means, the other way to think about it is I'm, I'm less and less like, I like leisure less and less relatively, relative, um, relative to consumption, right? 
So let me just kind of take two points, right? Point A versus point B, how they're different. In point A, you have lots of uh, consumption goods. And in point B, uh, very few consumption goods. Now in point A, you are very, very, very much willing to give up C to gain one unit of L. Right? So this actually, this is measuring by the slope. Because you, you are willing to move from point A slightly to the right hand side. And your willing is measured by this slope. You're very willing to. But now at here, so you will give up, you're willing to, willing to give up a very little C to get I, right? But what this means, essentially just, this is just tell you the diversity. Because here, so you have a lot of C. Right? You prefer something different and then you're willing to give up, give up a lot of C to get something different. But now here, so you have very little C. And then your diversity probably should go this direction instead of go to this direction. Okay, so here, so you want to have more consumption goods instead of leisure, because you have a lot of leisure. And hence, you're willing to give a very little C to get L. All right, so this is what this slope is declining means. All right, so this, again, this is measuring you prefer diversity or you prefer to consume a different goods, not only one goods. Right. Finally, so this slope, so we have a name, it's called marginal rate of substitution. Okay. So this is essentially, so at which rate you are willing to substitute leisure for consumption. Right? And here, and here, so you're willing to substitute L for leisure is very high. You're willing to give up lots of consumption, you get one leisure, one unit of leisure. Meaning here you really cares about leisure. But now here you're willing to substitute consum uh, leisure for consumption is gonna very low. Because we have a lot of you have lots of uh, leisure. You don't need more leisure. Now you prefer diversity, you want to have more consumption. Right. All right, so to summarize, so here we have marginal rate of substitution of leisure for consumption, right? So the essential is measuring the, at the rate at which the consumer is willing to substitute, is willing to substitute leisure for consumption good, or the MRA is, is going to measuring the consumer willing to gain additional leisure but uh, this is measured by how much consumption good, consumption good, the consumer is willing to give up, right? And certainly the higher, the marginal rate of substitution, the stronger incentive or stronger preference over leisure. The lower, the marginal rate of substitution, and then uh, the weaker their incentive, right? But why? So this incentive decline is because at this point, so he has lots of C and they prefer something different. And here, so he has very little C, okay? And then he doesn't like this L any, uh, as, as, as at this point. Right. So now we look at consumers constraint, right? So certainly everyone's making a constraint. So the resource are scarce. If not, there's no point of economics. Now let's see, so what's the constraint the consumer face? The main constraint the consumer face is our, okay? Here it's given by this equation. On the right hand side is our, this hours of time available. Again, here we should interpret this as 16 hours per day. Because usually each of us needs around eight hours of sleep. Now on the left hand side, there are two ways the consumer can spend these 16 non-sleep hours. Either take some leisure or supply labor. Okay. Supply labor so that they can get some income, so that they can consume some other goods they like. So this is a constraint. Now 
we can we can write down the consumers the like income constraint right so let's see what this means w is the wage and a is does the hours work right and then so these two you, you multiply these together so that's the total income This is a total income. So to represent this is like total labor income. Because there are other sources of income. Now you have a pi. What is pi? Pi is what we call the dividend income. Essentially, this is coming from firms. By the way, so we have not talked about firms yet. Right? But you can imagine, like in principal principal class or even in the, in the previous lecture. We talk about the way we understand our economy is, so there are two parties. One is the household. The other is firms. Okay. So what they do, households are going to purchase goods and services from firms in the goods market. Okay. They also interact in the factory market. So what they do in factory market, households are going to Supply the labor. Households are going to rent the capital to firm. Firm is going to produce. Firm sell those goods, and then they have some profit. And profit eventually will go back to households. Right? So this is what we call the pie. So that's why pie will belong to households. Now we have this wage income plus the dividend income. So that's the total income. But then, so everyone is subject to tax. This is something no one can avoid. Right, you may you may pay your tax, okay, and then so that's going to give you your here. So the right hand side is your disposable income. Disposable income, okay. and in this simple model, so C equal to your disposable income, meaning there's no saving. Now why there's no saving for now? So the model is, is very simple, as simple as possible, because the economy loss for only one period. But if, if the economy only lasts for one period, there's no point for you to save because there's no future. But certainly in later chapter, we will extend it or we will relax this assumption. We are going to consider multiple periods. And then there, we are going to look at households saving behavior. Right? For now, let's just focus on one period and here our focus is the trade-off between C and the labor supply. But from this budget constraint, we we kind of already can see the trade-off. What is the trade-off? So if you work more and there's clearly so the income is going to increase, C is going to increase. But now if we go to the previous slides, if you work more and then this clearly means this is going to decline because you're subject to the total hours available, this construct, right? So now we are going to do some manipulation. So by the way, start with the first one. Okay, so this essentially is just a copy paste from this one, except, except we just use a, uh, we use L plus N equal to H, that just means N equal to H minus L. Okay. So that's how we get here. Okay. Right. We got this is how we get here. Okay. So this is essentially this is N supply. Now the second and the third line. Just, just pure algebra. We end up with this equation. Okay. And the reason why we have this equation or what is the convenience of the last equation is that now we can write C as a function of L. And here, so clearly you can see, you can see the relationship or the trade-off between C and L, right? And furthermore, so why we just write this one is because the U, your preference is going to be dependent on C and L. Now we are going to write this, and then, so this is easy to plot, it's easy to plot. 
in this in this diagram, right? So again, so we have leisure, we have consumption. Earlier we talked about inter indifference curve. Now we are going to plot the budget constraint, right? But now in terms of budget constraint, there are two possibilities. Possibility number one, when t is greater than pi, meaning your tax is so high, tax is so high, okay, it's so high. It's such that when you when you spend all of your time to work, okay, if you if you go to here, okay, in order to maintain, so to say, in order to maintain a c equal to zero, if you have c equal to zero, just look at this one. If c equal to zero, okay, if this is greater than if this is greater than pi, okay, and then immediately, so by the way, so if c, just think about c equals zero. So pi minus tau, this is a negative number. And then here you must have a positive number, right? And this is a positive number, what this means. And then it means you take some, so you have some leisure, so your L is less than H. Right, and that's why you end up with here. Okay, if t is sufficiently large, if t is sufficiently large, okay, so there's so much tax you have to pay, so much tax you have to pay, and then so the best you can do is just go to this point. Now, actually, probably go to the next one is easier. Okay, so now if your tax, if tax is is low, meaning if you just take full leisure. Even you don't work it here, so just you just you just don't work at all. Okay? If you don't work, you still have some consumption, all right? So that's that's the difference. Actually, so we are going to focus on this one. We're going to focus this one. Okay. So now, what the consumer is going to do? So they are going to choose the consumption bundle. So that's going to give you, they choose the consumption bundle. Also, that's going to allow them to have the highest indifference curve, right? Maybe just go to here, it's, it's better. So this line A, B, and D, so this line, what is this line? This is the budget constraint. So this is something the consumer must, must face or this is a this is a constraint they must satisfy right so okay it's just right now so this is a constraint this is a constraint and clearly so everything inside inside so you know this dot inside this is a feasible but not efficient okay or is not preferred why because inside this this inside this constraint inside this A, B, and D. Okay. So you can choose, but you're not exhausting your resource. Like here, if you choose G, if you choose this point, so that means you work a lot, you work a lot, okay? But then, so actually it's what you can do is you can increase your consumption, right? So actually if you choose G, just means you have that much of money, you didn't, you didn't spend, you just let it go. So this is not the right choice. So hence, you must choose something along this boundary. So that's the basic you can do. Now, along this boundary, and then you're going to try to move up your indifference curve as, as further away, as further away from this as possible, right? Okay, actually, so this coming from the indifference curve, the more is preferred compared with less, meaning the further away from the origin and then higher, uti higher indifference, higher, higher utility meaning I1 is preferred to I2. Now, the best that you can do is probably like this H. Okay, so you're going to choose this one and as further away from origin. And then, then the best you can do, which is probably just slightly, just, just marginally touch your budget constraint. Okay. So now let's see what this means. So when we reach this dot, let's go back here. When we reach this point, so we are going to see an interesting thing. So first, so the slope 
of this voltage constraint equal to equal to uh, here is equal to the merger wave substitution at this indifferent curve. Okay, let me write a slope of BC equal to MR is L and C. Okay, but first, what is the slope? What is the slope? The slope, let's go back here. Slope of this, this of this line, budget constraint, will equal to the wage rate, right? Actually, so this is essentially the opportunity cost of leisure, right? Because for each hour of leisure, you're going to give up the unit consumption goods. And why is because if you take one more hour's leisure, you're going to lose wage of W. And the wage W is going to give you W units of consumption. So that's the optical cost. But that's also slow. Now back to here. Okay. So slope of the BC equal to W, which in the margin rate of substitution in the optimal is equal to the slope. Meaning, so the optimal choice for you is just choose your bundle of consumption and the leisure such that the margin rate of substitution between C and uh, between L and C equal to wage. Right? It summarizes it here. Uh, okay, so before I show you what is particular about this one, let's just go back here and understand. So, what's the intuition? Okay, so by the way, just write down. So in uh, optimal, okay, the best they can do is just choose and write down, choose wage equal to marginal rate of substitution and leisure and consumption. But but by the way, what this means? This means, okay, so in the margin, okay, remember, so we always think in the margin, in the margin. Okay, so what is trade off? If the households take one more unit of leisure, okay, and then what is the cost? What is the benefit? Okay, so the cost is going to be the wage they are going to lose, meaning so that's equivalent to give you. Double unit of C, double units of C, the consumption goods. What is the benefit? Okay, the benefit actually is measured by marginal rate of substitution. Okay, MRS, ONS, right? Because now here, so you're trying to increase L in the cost of C, right? And then, so this MRS is measuring your willingness to substitute L for C, right? But remember, actually, so once we increase leisure, we go to the right hand side. Let's go back. If we go to this direction, the marginal rate of substitution is start to decline. Right, start to decline. So hence, you don't have any incentive to increase your leisure, right? Because once you increase the leisure, and then the benefits start to smaller than the cost okay so that is that is the intuition All right but then so once we reach this point once we reach this point okay so we reach the optimal choice now what is this particular so this just says it could be the end of a case you are end up with a corner solution it, this is very likely, this is very likely, your marginal rate of substitution may not equal to W, right? How we understand that? How we understand that? And it could be the case, so if you just, if it is possible, if you extend this, this line, if you extend this line, and it might be the case, you can just, you move, you prefer to go somewhere here, but this doesn't allow you to do that. So maybe it's a better way to grab is just me just grab slightly different. Okay. 
it might be the case. So you're you're gonna you're going to prefer something like this. But this is not allowed because this region is not feasible because there's too much tax you have to pay. All right? And then you end up with here. All right. But usually, so we don't, usually we would uh, like to focus on case like this. This sometimes we call interior solution. Interior solution. Interior means, so we are not go to the boundary either here or here. All right. So now, we have to understand household's purpose. We understand household budget. We understand household's optimization problem or how they're going to choose the optimal bundle between consumption and leisure. Now we're ready to use this simple model to do some solid experience or to understand how consumers are going to respond to certain change. Right. So we are going to look at two thought experience. One, what happens if there's a change in tax? And secondly, what happens if there's a change in wage? Okay. And then after these uh, two experiments, we are going to decompose the effect of the change into, into two categories. The first is called income effect. The other is substitution effect. Right. So what is the income effect? Essentially, that is going to understand what's the impact on the budget constraint of the consumer. Right. So the 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 total constraint is going to relax. On the other hand, so the substitution effect essentially understand the impact of a cost benefit of working additional hour or more specifically, so how the opportunity cost, opportunity cost of leisure change, how would that affect your C and L choice? Okay. Now let's look at examples. And first understand what's income effect, what is substitution effect. Judge image Randy, he bought 1,000 shares of Apple at a price of 90 in early 2000, so after more than a decade. And then so if he just suddenly wake up, because so for example, he just forgot, so his share. And he's never pay attention to the share. And then so today, so he suddenly realized, okay, so I have some shares of Apple. So why not take a look? And then the suddenly he realized, so he has, a, he has a fortune in this in this year. Right? And this, this is like a pure income effect. Nothing else changed. Only change is suddenly he realized he has additional income. Alternatively, we can imagine an example. So Randy maybe just bought a Powerball and he won a lottery. That's just pure income effect. Now, what is a pure substitution effect? So just image Randy, same guy. He works usually works for thirty five dollars an hour. But now just 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 for one time. So there's another rich guy, Mark, want to take a private lesson and then we will pay Randy for three hundred fifty dollars per hour. So that just uh, that's going to change the opportunity cost. Opportunity cost of leisure. And then clearly this is going to change his merger decision between work or leisure because that's going to change cost and benefit. Right? So the cost, if he just take more leisure or just like usual, and so he's going to lose $350. What's the benefit? So that's just usual benefit he has. I don't know, so he preferred, probably likes to watch TV. And then so converting to consumption goods, that's depending on marginal rate of substitution. Right, so this one hour's TV watching, maybe keeping $35, right? So now this is going to completely change the margin. Yeah. Right, so now let's just further put some assumptions so that we can understand. So this income effect, substitution effect. Because so we assume consumption and leisure, they are both normal goods, meaning when income increase, when your income increase, so both C and the leisure will increase. Hence, if there's an increase in dividend or decrease in tax, 
So in either case, remember, so you have a budget constraint, right? So the your total income, your total income equal to W times NS plus pi minus T. So if there's increase in pi or decrease in T, so your total income is going to increase. Your total income increase because your C and L, they are normal goals, both will increase. Hence, the pure income effect tells so both C and L both will increase. Now, this is going to this is going to be clear on this diagram. So, what we have in this diagram, we have A L leisure C consumption, and then this is A B D is your budget constraint. Okay. Now, because there's an increase in pi or there's a decrease in T, this total income, disposable income increase. And hence, hence this, this A, B, D is going to expand. It's going to expand. And actually, so there's nothing change in other dimension. More specifically, wage stay the same. Okay? Hence, these two is going to parallel. Remember the slope of this budget constraint is going to give you the wage. Now, the households has more room in terms of plan. Now you can see, so they can attain I2 instead of I1, and the clearly I2 is preferred to I1. And if we compare K versus H, so that's the perfect example of, of income effect, right? How do you see that? So if you compare K versus H, you can see not only C increase, L also increase, right? So the why is because both C and L, they are normal goods. On the other hand, we are going to study the substitution effect. Substitution effect, right? So here, just imagine Ben works for $35 per hour at his current club, but another tennis club offer him $50 per hour. The question is, will Ben increase his number of hours or not? But this is a tricky question. There are two effects. Number one, the reward or the benefit of working is greater, or another word, the, uh, the, the cost of not working is higher. Right. Because of this higher wage and the band is tempted to work more, or in other words, N is, it's going to increase. Why? Because the benefit of working higher or the cost of leisure is higher. However, the other side of the same coin, band, so now, say for example, so usually, so he makes like $350. Okay. At, the, at the current rate, he must work 10 hours. So now he only needs to work seven hours. Okay. So how that is going to change his calculation, right? So he may want to more leisure, right? So this is going to show up here. There are two effects. So clearly there is a, there is a substitution effect. What is the substitution effect? If wage increase, meaning the opportunity cost of leisure increase, right? And then, so he's going to, willing to work, willing to work more, okay? Willing to work more because the leisure becomes more expensive. On the other hand, there's an income effect. What's the income effect? If he, even though he keeps the same rate, sorry, same hours, because the wage increase, his income is going to increase. Right? Then, then because of the substitution effect, he's going to strengthen this further. So his income is going to increase further. But now remember, as we discussed earlier, so income increase leads to labor supply is going to decrease. Or in other words, leisure is going to increase. Right, because leisure are normal goods. The more money he has, and then the more leisure he wants as well. Right. But these two together, 
you can see there is a mixed effect on labor supply, right? But the, the impact on consumption is clear. Actually, so we can see from this diagram, we start with A, B, and D. Okay. And because of the wage increase, you end up with E, B, D. Let me write down. You start with A, B, D. You end up with E, B, D. So this old budget constraint, this is a new budget constraint. And on this diagram, you can see, so the optimal choice is gonna move from F, is a move from F to H. But this is, we just construct this very carefully to show the point. So, okay, so right now, so your optimal choice move from F to H. If you compare F to H, what happens? So, uh, C, sorry, C increase, L stay the same. But in order to understand what's going on with L, we draw a third line. What is the third line? It's the third line, let me write it here. So A, B, D, and then the far right, you have E, B, D. And in the middle, also we draw a different line. So I will use a different color. It's red one. In the middle, so we have J, we have, uh, let's see, what is, JFD. Okay. So the, the point of drawing this JFD is what? So first of all, what is particular about the JFD? Uh, what is just JKD, yeah, JKD. What is particular about a JKD? So JKD would draw JKD such that number one, JKD has the same slope as EBD is number one, meaning so higher wage, Re meaning it reflects the fact wage has increased. But at the same time, we draw GKD such that GKD is going to tangent with the original, the original I1. Right? Look at here. So it's tangent with O. But it's O and F belong to the same indifferent curve. Right. So here, this just means so JKD reflects the change in wage only. Right. Remember, so when the wage increase, when wage increase, it's going to have two effects. One is going to change opportunity cost. Of leisure. At the same time, wage increase is going to increase total income. Okay. And this too is going to have opposite impact on leisure choice. Okay. And then so this exercise is trying to isolate or separate this two effects. In order to separate this effect, we draw the third line JKD. And this JKD, how this JKD is help? First, we draw JKD such that it keep the wage, but we are going to keep the same indifferent curve as ABD. So in that sense, the JKD only have the substitution, substitution even, not income even. Let me erase, there's too many things, let me summarize. Okay, and maybe just the earlier color and then start with. So again, to summarize, it ends that we move from A, B, D to E, B, D. Okay, to understand that, we draw a third line, which is J, K, D. Okay, and the J, K, D, so again, it's just the third color. So J, K, D, has the wage, new wage, okay. but stay in the same I1. So meaning, so keep the substitution effect, but no income effect. But finally, EBD, so EBD has a wage and a different I, right? So this is gonna keep both 
in a uh, substitution effect and the income effect. Now let's see. So if that's original choice goes to O, and that O goes to H. F to O is what? F to O, this is F to O. Okay, F to O. And then so O to H. Right, so the F to O, like I said, so we keep the wage, I mean the new wage, but kill the income effect. So here, this is pure substitution effect. O to H, so you already have the wage, compare EBD to JKD, compare this one to this one. You already have the wage, doesn't change, and hence here you only have the income effect. Right? Now let's see so how the in substitution effect and income effect affects the choice with substitution effect. So Hauser is going to substitute C for leisure. Why they do that is because leisure becomes more expensive. They want to reduce leisure. Now, what is the income effect? Because your income increase and then both your C and then your, oh, by the way, so O is going to be here. Right? So it just increases C, but decrease leisure. Now from O to H, so you increase C further and you increase your leisure. So particularly these two is cancel each other, right? Or the substitution effect and income effect in this particular example, they just cancel with each other. And there's hence the leisure stays same okay, in this particular example. All right. Now from this example, we also can derive this labor supply curve. What's labor supply curve? When wage rate increase, the employment is going to increase. Okay. But some students may be wondering, so isn't that the case when wage increase here, when wage increase here, isn't that leisure means, for the means labor supply stay the same? In this example, yes, it's true. If you raise and highlight, okay. In this in this graph, it is true. So when wage increase, labor supply stay the same, right? Why? Because here is substitution effect is cancel with income effect. Hence, there's no change. Okay. But in general case or in the data. Usually what we observe is income effect dominates the substitution effect. Hence when wage increase, the labor supply is going to increase. So then end up with this upward slope labor supply curve. We will use that for future, future lectures. Okay. Now let's see. So what's the impact of an increase in dividend income or decrease in tax? On labor supply. So first we have this labor supply, right? So remember how we derive that, how we derive that, right? So the wage increase is going to have substitution effect and income effect. Okay, substitution effect says it's going to reduce leech, reduce labor supply, and income supply is going to increase. Sorry, let me let me erase. Okay. Just be clear. So wage increase. It's going to have two impact on labor supply. One is substitution effect. You're going to increase labor supply. And the second, you have income effect. You're going to reduce labor supply. But usually, so the substitution effect dominates income effect. Hence, labor supply is going to increase when wage increase. I apologize, I probably made the wrong statement in the previous slide. Okay, so this is actually what happens. Let me repeat. So wage change has substitution effect and income effect. What is substitution effect? It's because the opportunity cost of leisure change. If wage increase and the opportunity cost of leisure increase, means more expensive take leisure. Hence the labor supply will increase. On the other hand, so your wage increase, your income is going to increase, and leisure is going to increase, hence labor supply is going to decrease. But if, but if usually substitution effect dominates, 
And then, so the net effect on labor supply is going to be positive, meaning so wage increase is going to increase labor supply. So that's why this curve is upward slope. Now, if there's an increase in dividend, meaning there's an income increase, and then leisure is going to increase, has labor supply is going to decrease. That's why the curve shifts to the left. Alternatively, if the top tax decrease, similar does means income is going to increase. Leisure is going to increase, labor supply is going to decrease. Okay, as the curve shifts to the left. All right, so this one. And in some cases, we may have like a very special purpose, like this one. And here, so you have a perfect complement. Right? Just give you an example, what's perfect complement? If someone uses AirPod, okay, your left one versus your right one, you just need them in the constant share with one by one. Right? This is a perfect complement. Right? And then mathematically here, we can say so C and L is like constant fraction. If you think of AirPod, it means your left one must equal to your right one. It means in terms of a quantity, right? Okay. So anyway, oh, sorry. So now here, and now here. So you have a very special preference. So this preference is tells us, tells you, you must consume these things together. Oh, apologize. So you, need to, you need to consume these two together, right? You end up with this indifferent curve, but clearly this is very easy. It's very, um, it's very intuitive to understand. If you have a certain amount of leisure, right? And if they already, so this is a, this is a level, determine your, determines your preference. Now, if you increase C, the X or C is just a half. Okay, use the example of uh, airport. If say for example, this is, you have like one, and this is also one to one. Now, if you have two left and left, and left and airport, it won't help you or won't increase your preference. Uh, won't increase, increase your, your T, right? Now, we are going to look at example to understand the stuff we just discussed. Now this question asks you the following scenario. Suppose Chris works part-time as cashier and earn a higher wage over time. Okay, means just additional hours. He received a real wage of W for the Q hours and for hours after Q, he's going to he's going to earn more W2 greater than W1. Assume there's no tax or no, uh, there's no tax or no other income. And he's free to choose hours work and his preference given by this complementarity. Now this, ask you, this question asks you, illustrate the answer in a diagram. That means how he chose his optimal choice. Okay. So the question, so yeah, so let me draw this diagram. You have L, you have C, okay, you have Q, this is important Q, and this is your total L, H, right? So before Q, so you may have a curve like uh, the logic constraint like this. Now after Q, so you can see it's become steeper. Oh, sorry, it's the other way around, all the way around. Okay, so let me start again. Because this is a leisure, okay? So this is C, so this is H. Now here, uh, here, so this is H. Minus Q, right? So this works for Q hour. Okay. So this is a right. So basically, this part 
the slope is higher. Uh, I probably need a better graph. Let me try again. Let me try again. L, C, right, so this one, this two. Maybe just exaggerate a little bit. Okay, so not straight line, but it's just supposed to be straight line. So which is basically what I'm trying to draw is this part is steeper compared to this one, right? No, you have his preference. Preference is gonna give something like this, right? So this is how this is how it looks like. All right. Okay, so I'm gonna skip this one, right? So this this is a case study. Okay, so yeah, I'm gonna I'm gonna skip this case study. So now let me just quickly wrap up what we discussed in this lecture. So in this lecture, we focus on consumer. We focus on consumer, okay? We focus on consumer's behavior. And so consumer behavior in terms of, in terms of, sorry. So we focus on consumer behavior in terms of consumption and leisure. We started preference. We study budget constraint, and then we study how consumer make their optimization problem so that they choose the optim optimal bundle of them, the C and L. In the next lecture, we will pick up firms behavior, see how firms make their optimal choice. And then, so we are going to, from there, we kind of have a, have a complete picture regarding to how the market in the micro level, how the market works from consumer and a firm.